coming up next. Stay tuned to learn more about the state of the art in blockchain and cryptocurrency technology. Reimagine 2020. Hey guys, it's Mark Yusko. I'm founder, CEO, and chief investment officer of Morgan Creek Capital Management, also the co-founder and partner of Morgan Creek Digital Assets. It's really exciting to be here with you this morning at Reimagine 2020. Hey everybody, it is Patrick McLean, as you know, one of your hosts here for Reimagine 2020. Um, as you know, we're going for 72 hours here, right? And the benefit of that, like the benefit if you can find a benefit in the current situation, it's that we get to do things now like virtual conferences. We don't have to pay our people to fly over the world and like buy hotel rooms, et cetera, right? We get, to, we get to have more conversations, right? Like I bet you if I were to throw a conference somewhere, my next guest, I, it would probably be a little hard for me to get him there, right? But like now I, now I actually have a chance to talk to them today. And to kind of frame the conversation a little bit, and, and uh, I'll let Mark introduce himself in a second. But, you know, again, we know that there's thousands of students watching this right now, right? We know kind of general crypto community or blockchain community is watching this right now. What I, what the perspective I think Mark is going to bring is, you know, both from an institutional side, right? Like how are investors thinking about this, right? Which is, I don't, on some aspects of the cryptocurrency world, we want to kind of act like rebels and, and, and that like, you know, uh, these, these kind of global uh, thought leaders opinions are, aren't relative, but I, I would tend to disagree. And uh, before I go on too long, Mark, I want you to go ahead and introduce yourself and, and maybe tell everybody a little bit about how you got into blockchain. No, great. I appreciate the intro and, and uh, exciting to be part of this event. I, th I think all the points you made about, you know, look, it's, it's an historic time. Uh, lots of excitement and enthusiasm around the space and, and lots of topics to talk about. So, um, you know, I, I run this firm called Morgan Creek Capital Management, a traditional asset management firm, uh, registered investment advisor based here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, we do have a small office in Shanghai, China, where we, we do some private investing and then we have an office up in New York. And uh, to your point on, on uh, the benefits of virtual conferences, I do think it's amazing uh, don't have to travel halfway around the world and disrupt your, your life. On the other hand, given, given where you're hanging out in Thailand, I probably would uh, be excited to join you there. So uh, quick background on us. You know, Morgan Creek was founded 15 years ago. Uh, we came out of the team and I came out of the university endowment world. Uh, I worked at my alma mater for a number of years, Notre, Notre Dame. And then I ran the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's endowment for seven years. Brought my team across back in 2004, and we set up this registered investment advisor to help people think differently about investing. Our big thing has been integrating alternative investments into traditional portfolios, uh, things like hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, uh, other strategies that, that a lot of people at the beginning, you know, if you go back 25 years ago, you know, hedge funds, right? They were where all the bad people were. People were afraid of them. Or junk bonds, right? That's where all the bad people were. Uh, so we've tried to, you know, soothe those rough edges, get people to understand these are institutional strategies. They're not really different asset classes. At the end of the day, they're, they're four assets, stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities. And so uh, lately, we have been spending a lot of time in the blockchain space, the infrastructure space, and the cryptocurrency space. And we can talk more about how, how we got there, but that's uh, where, why we formed this new entity called Morgan Creek Digital Assets as a subsidiary of Morgan Creek Capital. Got it. And, um, you know, I want to get in quite a bit of, uh, more about kind of how Morgan Creek's looking at the market. But, you know, before we do that, I, I would like to hear a little bit about your story. So, you know, and you and I were chatting just for a second before this call. Uh, you know, I, I, it's am I safe to say that, like, maybe your, your, your peers in the institutional space maybe aren't as bullish on blockchain or Bitcoin as you are? Uh, it is very safe to say that. In fact, uh, I get all the time, you know, why are you doing this, right? Why are you spending time talking about magic internet money? Or, you know, why are you, you know, diverging away from the traditional world into this, you know, crazy alternative world of, of blockchain? And uh, we'll, we'll talk why. Um, but yeah, definitely, 
uh, it's not the norm at this point for the institutional community to be thinking, or even the, really the family office community. There are some forward-looking investors, some forward-looking uh, family offices, and even a few forward-looking institutions, which we've been able to find to, to work with Morgan Creek. But it is, it is definitely uh, on the fringes, and we'll talk about why that word fringe is really important. Got it. And, and can you gonna, can you take me through your evolution? Like, like, you know, maybe what was your, and, and, and even maybe for the investment side, like, like life experiences that kind of brought you to this point in, in philosophy and, and, you know, how did you end up here? Yeah, look, I, I love that question. You know, how did you get here or how come you're here? Uh, you know, I would say my life is, is really a series of happy accidents. You know, I didn't grow up thinking I was going to be an investment guy. Uh, I actually grew up thinking I was going to be an architect. And, uh, you know, most of the audience is too young to remember there was a show on television uh, called The Brady Bunch. And The Brady Bunch was about these two families that came together, three guys and three girls, or three, three kids on each side, mom and dad, divorce, get together. Uh, long story short, uh, Mr. Brady wanted, was an architect. And I thought that was the coolest job ever. So I went to college to be an architect, uh, lasted one semester before I realized that was not what I wanted to do. Uh, dabbled in engineering for a while, turned out really not my thing. Uh, and so I gravitated toward the sciences, biology and chemistry. And that's what I ended up. I, I did biology and chemistry degree, graduated, thought I was going to go to medical school, uh, decided very late not to go to med school. And when you graduate with a pre-med degree, uh, there are basically two jobs you can take if you don't go to med school. You can be a pharmaceutical sales rep or you can be a consultant in healthcare. Given that I'm not 6'4 and handsome, couldn't be a pharmaceutical sales rep, so had to go be a consultant, uh, got a job offer. But the guy who I was going to work for said, you know, you should probably go to business school. And back then, you know, I'm old, so back then in the 80s, you could still go directly to business school. Now, I don't think that's a great idea for most people, but someone who had not taken any accounting or finance or investments it was a good thing for me. So I went, got my basically equivalent of an undergrad degree in business uh, at University of Chicago. And then I just took the first job that was offered. And then the first happy accident happened. Uh, the guy who was doing investments, I went to work for an insurance company. The guy who was doing investments retired. My boss, the CFO said, hey, you want to do the investment portfolio? I'm like, sure, why not? And uh, we were bond investors. So I learned how to invest in fixed income, uh, hired some external managers who ran some of the money in-house. Uh, after a couple of years, I left and went to an equity firm uh, called Discipline Investment Advisors, a quant shop set up by two professors at Northwestern. Again, another happy accident, just a friend of a friend had referred me. And what I found was, was that I really loved this idea of quantitative investing and quantitative modeling. And I remember asking my, my uh, boss once, he said, you know, why don't we you know, ever... Uh, talk to management teams or, you know, look at other things besides the, the numbers, the quant and on the computer. And he said, why would I ever want to talk to management? All they do is lie. And he didn't mean it. He said, I don't mean it in a negative sense. It's just that they believe their story and they're going to tell you a good story. So the numbers are real. The data is real. Uh, and we'll probably come back to talking about data and, and how good data leads to good decisions and bad data leads to bad decisions later when we talk about, about the virus and other things. But uh, I don't do short well, by the way, so I'll try to finish up. So the, the, the last part of the story is uh, I got the call. And again, most people won't remember this story, but there's this famous football coach named Lou Holtz. He was the coach at University of Minnesota, and he had a lifetime contract unless Notre Dame called. Notre Dame called. He went to Notre Dame, had a great career there. And I was kind of the same thing. I worked at this firm. We had a billion dollars back when a billion dollars was a lot of money in the early 90s. And uh, now trillions is a big number. But, you know, billion dollars was a lot of money back then. And uh, I probably never would have left. There were five of us. Now, you know, the older guys kept all the money. So, yes, young guys didn't make a lot. But someday maybe we would have done okay. But uh, I got the call. I got the call from the alma mater at Notre Dame. And the neat thing about it was that when I went there, I realized very quickly that investing was not about picking stocks and bonds. Investing was about asset allocation, big picture asset allocation, getting into the right asset classes. Are you in stocks? Are you in bonds? Are you in real estate? Are you in commodities? 
Are you long? Are you short? Are you in Japan or Europe or the US? Those big decisions were way more important than whether you own Ford or GM. You know, everybody spends all their life analyzing companies or analyzing fixed income or balance sheets. That's a small part of returns, about 10 to 15%. And so this, this idea of, of uh, asset allocation focused investing and this thing called the endowment model. Uh, and the endowment model is, is unique. It's, it's basically a focus on long-term investing, equity orientation, value orientation, a discipline to rebalance the portfolio and not just let your winners run and your losers run. Uh, and then the last thing is that it's a consistent focus on innovation. And that's actually how we ended up here together today is the universities have this history of always investing in innovation through venture capital. And because of that, uh, I've had a history of, of investing in some really cool technology companies. You know, back in 96, uh, we invested in this little company, this little startup called Google. Now at the time, they didn't need to be another search engine. You know, they were number 21. There were 20 other good search engines. And uh, what we people didn't realize is that they were gonna revolutionize search by doing it a different way through optimization and indexing. And so we put half a million dollars in uh, this little company uh, through a firm called Sequoia. And, you know, long story is we took out $200 million. I joke, there should be a quad at Notre Dame called the Google Quad. And, uh, you know, from there, this internet innovation turned into the mobile net. Uh, and 10 years later, we made some great investments in Alibaba and Facebook and, and uh, other companies around the, the, the mobile net. And maybe I'll pause there and that's background. And then we can get to the next question on, on uh, how we kind of got to this point on, on uh, blockchain and, and crypto. Well, Obviously, a lot to unpack there. I'll, also, I'll say, start with a few things. One, I can't tell if you're six four sitting down on Zoom, but you aren't bad. <laughs> but you aren't not. You aren't bad looking. Uh, the second thing is, I, I was. I heard you say Brady Bunch. I was. La I'm laughing because the other day uh, I posted something online. It went viral. I, my, my friends have been messaging me all day, but uh, I, I I looked at an image of the Brady Bunch, like the the TV shot where they're all in yes. a quadrant, and I was like. I was like, the Brady Bunch are the original Zoom call, right? Everybody's in quarantine on Zoom calls. I'm like, man, the Brady Bunch were like ahead of their time, right? Like, um, but, you know, and I want to kind of get to, to more of your perspectives, I think, like uh, current global market, right, and, and kind of where we're at. But before we jump there, and again, I think for a lot of these students, and, and I, I feel like multiple things you just said, whether it's getting the call, right, like where people like – I think sometimes people think that their life is just going to like come to accumulation and they're going to take all these steps. And they're going to get there. Um, but it really, it's, it is kind of a series of luck sometimes, right? I've, I've seen that myself and I, and I find a lot of people, um, you know, now we can influence this. So, so I think it's important. Right, and we'd like to get your perspective a little bit more. Uh, so maybe people can learn uh, from you, but can you tell me like, when is, when was your like aha moment? Like when is the first time maybe you heard about Bitcoin or blockchain? Then when did you like jump into it? And what year was that uh, roughly? Yeah, so a couple of things that are really important there. So, you know, funny thing is when I'm sitting down, I am like six three, six four. When I stand up, I'm six foot. I got no legs. So uh, that's why you couldn't tell. But uh, this, is, yeah. this, is the, this, is, this is the Zoom effect. Yeah, and, and I do appreciate the, the, uh, the comment on the looks. But the Brady Bunch definitely were the earliest Zoomers. And uh, now here we are all Zooming. But what I think is interesting is students in particular, you know, we've been beat into us when we're, when we're young. Oh, we have to know what we're going to do the rest of our life. Look, I, I had multiple majors. I, I sampled lots of stuff. You know, I started in insurance, ended up doing investing, ended up doing asset management, ended up going to a university. Then ended up, you know, spinning out and forming my, my own firm. Uh, but it wasn't until I was 41 years old. So, you know, life doesn't have to be known on day one. And you should try lots of things. And one of the big things is, is part of our culture is all about focusing on what you're not good at, right? If you get four A's and a D, what do your parents do? They hire tutors. They make sure you focus on your D. What they should do is say, hey, drop that class and focus on the A's because you're actually really good at that and you suck at that, so it's okay. We don't have to be good at everything. Let's focus on our strengths, not try to be great at everything. 
And that's this whole participation trophy problem, right? Everybody participates, everybody gets a trophy. No, winners get trophies. So it is about winning. Now your question on, um, you know, kind of that aha moment is I've had lots of aha moments. And, and I love the aha moment because literally with, with Bitcoin and crypto and, and blockchain, it really was this, right? It was this eureka moment. And, and so the, the story, the backstory is 2013, I have a close friend um, that is named Dan Moorhead. Some may have heard of him. He runs a firm called Pantera. And Dan, I've known Dan for 25 years. He was at Tiger Management, a big hedge fund that uh, we've been involved in. Julian Robertson was a mentor of mine for many years when I worked at the university. He's a big UNC grad. And uh, long story short is when Dan spun out to form his macro hedge fund, we were his first institutional investor. So we helped put him in business 14, 15 years ago. And 2013, he calls me up and says, hey, come to San Francisco, I'll buy you dinner. I want to share some news. So I go out, we have dinner, and he's like, I'm shutting down the hedge fund, and I'm returning the money. Now, he had a billion dollars. Again, back when a billion dollars was a lot of money. So he gave back the money. And he said, I'm going to dedicate the rest of my career to blockchain and Bitcoin. Now, this is why I say I made the first of my many bad decisions on crypto, because I said, wait, 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 not to cut you up, but what year is this again? 2013. So 2000. middle of 2013 and out in San Francisco. And he says, all right, I'm going to start two funds, a Bitcoin fund and a blockchain infrastructure fund. Now I am an infrastructure guy. I like picks and shovels. I like technology. I think there's this technological innovation wave that we'll probably talk about at some point. And so I immediately got the infrastructure. So I'm like, I'm in. So now that fund's done great, right? It's up 11X, no one's complaining. It did early investments in Corbett and Zappo and Coinbase and, and all kinds of good stuff. No one's complaining, but I should have put the money in the Bitcoin fund. But the problem was in 2013, I was not you know, running drugs on Silk Road. I was not a cryptography student. I didn't get it. I, I kind of knew what it was, but I didn't really get it. And I didn't spend the time to get it. And that's the really important thing is anyone who has spent time learning about and understanding what Bitcoin is and what cryptography is and what blockchain technology is, they go all in. And that's, that's kind of where I am today. So that's 2013. I, I put some money in, in infrastructure. Don't put any money in Bitcoin, which I should have. Uh, so uh, about six months later, I write, I write these long letters uh, on a quarterly basis. And uh, I wrote one paragraph in a 40 page letter saying that I thought Bitcoin was an interesting special situation investment. It was about $500 at the time. Uh, it would just drop from a thousand. Now it was on its way to 175 at the bottom, but uh, I thought it was interesting. And I had clients call up and say, look, we'll fire you, right? We have no interest in you talking about magic internet money. So, well, okay, weird. Um, then my son who was at Notre Dame uh, getting ready to graduate. And I said, all right, go talk to Dan out in San Francisco. He wanted to be in San Francisco. Go talk to Dan. And one word, again, movie, this movie, The Graduate, there's this scene. I got one word, plastics. Well, my one word was blockchain. So go out, get a job with Zappo, Coinbase, whatever. I don't care which one, just, just go into the industry. He goes out, meets with the companies, says, you know, dad, I don't know, maybe, but yeah, I'm just going to go KPMG. It's safe. They'll bring me to San Francisco where I want to be. And uh, so we're laughing about it. Thanksgiving this past year is like, all right, fine, dad, you're right. But you're not as smart as you think you are. Like, oh, do tell. Why, why not? And he says, well, you didn't lever up the house and put it all in Bitcoin. Okay. Point taken. I, I bought a little, but I, I, you're right. I didn't take everything I have and put it in Bitcoin. So uh, he does go out to San Francisco. He hated KPMG, by the way. And now he works for this amazing firm called Snowflake. Um, so he's happy, but, uh, so that's 2015. Now, by then I started to convince clients, friends, others, that there was something here. And I had started to dive into the rabbit hole. And the thing about the rabbit hole is it doesn't go like this. It doesn't go straight down. It goes like this. The further down you go, the wider it gets and the more you get sucked down the hole. And so I was really starting to, to buy in. I went from spending no time in 13 to 5%, 10%, 20%, 25%, 30%. And by kind of 2016, 17, I was up to spending a third to 40% of my time on this. 
And I met this guy and a lot of, know, a lot of people know him. Uh, his name's Anthony Pompliano, goes by Pomp on the internet. And uh, Pomp and his partner, Jason, were running this firm uh, called Full Tilt. They were doing early stage investing. And we both made a late stage investment in a company called Lyft. Uh, we've done a lot of direct investing over the years, a lot of investing in innovation. We were early investors in Uber and Lyft and Quadi before it became Didi and Ola and Grab. We loved ride sharing. And we're all doing you know, this investment together. So I, we met 15, 20 minutes, didn't think too much of it. Uh, but about a week later, I heard him on Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcast. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. He sounds smart. Wait, I would have said that. That sounds like something I would say. That, that sounds like something I did say. Wait a second. And I would say, talking to Pomp is like talking to myself, younger, better looking version, but, but it's like talking to me. So I was like, I got to spend this time with this guy. So I meet him for breakfast, hour turns into three hours, turns into the next day, turns into just about every day for the next week. I'm like, all right, we got to work together. So uh, end of 2016, beginning of 2017, we say, all right, we're in, we're going to do this. And uh, we folded their full tilt into Morgan Creek. We opened up Morgan Creek Digital and we were set off to create our first fund uh, in blockchain infrastructure. Got it. So, and again, by the way, l like, love that story, right? Like, and, 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 and I hear part of what you're saying, and, and I, I kind of came a little late to this game. Like, I, I've been in technology my whole life, so it's like, I, I know the tech side. I know a little bit about the business side. When I came to it, you know, I, th I think there was enough people where I was watching it, right? And it was like, you know, maybe on, the, on some parts, there's like the general population thought they were like investors all of a sudden. Maybe you could reflect back on this ICO era. Really started to look at the technology clearly and just say, you know, I, I had had, I was always kind of known for having a lot of developers. So, you know, started dabbling in, right? I had a friend called me, I think uh, mid-2017, he almost had a breath like, Patrick, I just got off like a call with a bunch of powerful people that presented research. And one of the key points they, they drew out was uh, somebody at the very end presented, and I think this is again, mid 2017 ish said, we think there's less than 5,000 competent blockchain engineers, really like globally, right? And then I'm, I'm looking at the market size and I'm like, okay, like what's the opportunity here, right? Yeah. Um, so kinda, we kind of started looking at it and saying, okay, like this isn't easy to build, right? So I, I think there's, on, on one side, it's like you have a very, probably misunderstood technology. And I, and I think a lot of the facets of what happened either in the news cycle, past projects, not living up to expectations, people not maybe uh, being f uh, financially responsible, you know, in certain creative fundraising mechanisms, mm -hmm. right? I kind of applied this dark cloud over it. But, you know, what you just said, and, and, and why I think these conversations are interesting Again, I, I can, I, I, what people can love him or hate him, talk to Craig Wright the other day for two hours, right? And listen to what he's, uh, uh, talk to Roger Ver, like talk to these people and really listen to where were we at 2011, 2013, you know, and we've seen it from the education side. And I, I try to tell people sometimes, you know, I've seen schools, you know, 19, 20 year old kids form on campus blockchain organizations and then get a, basically a cease and desist letter from the university, right? Yeah. Binding them, it's like we, we can't affiliate with drug dealers, right? So, you know, I think this Silk Road effect can't be understated enough, right? Is, is that in, in the beginning of this technology, it was controversial, right? And it, it couldn't just be a technology, whether it's financial regulators not acting or, or acting aggressively or just not acting at all and creating vacuums or uh, things like Silk Road where now it's, it can't just be a technology, it's the drug dealer's technology. Um, and then, you know, a few other missteps, I think that happened. So, so I kind of understand that to be true, what you're saying. Yeah. Right. And, and so I guess, if, and I want to kind of move on here, but you know, through, through those, through those years, what did you learn? Like, if you, if you were to go back in time, I guess, maybe to 2013, like, uh, what would you, what advice would you give yourself? And like, what did you see evolve the most? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I definitely want to answer that question, but let me, let me hit your, your point on, on the fringe because this is really important. Every new technology starts on the fringe, right? Who is the first person to have a pager? Drug dealer. Who are the first people to use the internet widely? Porn. It's just the nature of the business. Why? Because the traditional world is locked out for them right? Take cannabis today, right? Why did cannabis start, the cannabis industry start using, you know, uh, digital technologies? Well, because the banking system said you can't have bank accounts with us. 
that seems silly because it's not nas- you know, it's not nationally legal, it's only state legal. So every great technology starts with the fringe, cell phones, you know, everything. So if you think about Bitcoin and blockchain, uh, the same thing happened. And when you're on the fringe, you get labeled as dangerous or, or negative. And, and that's why you see all these big incumbent players with their FUD, right? The fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You know, Jamie Dimon says it's a fraud. Now Jamie Dimon's going to make loans to, to Genesis. Uh, so all these people start off saying it's bad. Warren Buffett says it's, you know, like rat poison. I'm like, well, how do you know what rat poison tastes like, Warren, unless you're a rat? Okay. Or his partner, Charlie Munger, says, you know, wait a second. It's like trading in newly harvested dead baby brains. What the fuck, Charlie? Pardon my French. Although I said pardon my French once. And someone's, I was with a Frenchman. And they said, well, we're not vulgar. Why do you say that? I said, I don't know why we say that. Well, have you heard? Have you heard? Like, and we could take those two guys as an example. But like, have you seen anything else that has had this much of a, of a, of a pushback? I mean, in, in oh, your for opinion? sure. Every technology has this pushback, right? You go back to the beginning days of the cell phone. But, but, but like dead, ba- dead baby brains, like rat poisoning, like, like to that oh, extent. No, like- absolutely. When, when the cell phone started, right, you were going to kill people because it caused brain cancer and it was just this horrible thing. And with the internet, right, you were going to, again, you were going to j- change people's genetic makeup and their DNA. Uh, now we hear the same thing about 5G. Every new technology elicits negativity from the incumbents. And the more the incumbents have to lose, the more afraid they are and the more vehement they are about about pushing back. So, but your question, what did I learn? What would I tell myself uh, back in 13? I would have said, spend the time. And what I didn't do in 13 is here, I have one of the guys I respect, you know, top 10, 20 people I respect in the world saying, you know, I'm giving up a really good business. A billion dollar hedge fund at two and 20 is a really good business. So he was giving that up to raise his first fund was 15, one, $5 million. That's a big change. Now he's got over a billion dollars today, but there was, there was information content there. And uh, another guy I respect at a big venture fund came and spoke at one of our conferences. We do these conferences and, and uh, you know, he was jumping around the stage talking about blockchain. I'm like, hmm, okay. So I should have spent more time. In, and I think that's true of everything in life, right? Is you don't get that many really big life-changing opportunities, but most times we miss them because we're busy doing other stuff, right? I had a business to run. I had other things that I was focused on. And so I only had so much time to spend on this new, new thing. And looking back in my life, uh, there, this isn't the only time, right? Whether it was the internet in 96 or whether it was you know, personal computing. Look, I grew up in Seattle, Washington. Most of my friends that I grew up with don't work anymore because they went to work for Microsoft. I didn't. So I'm a little more conservative. I'm a little more, uh, I'm a first, you know, dutiful firstborn son. So I, I go to work and I do my job. And, and instead of saying, hey, you know what? I should really look at this, this new thing and spend the time to really understand it. Because uh, once I understood it, I was all in. And that is different, again, than most of my peers. And and look, I'm one of the, the few guys in this space who has white hair. You know, most of the people in this space are young. Um, you know, they're, they're technologically savvy like yourself. Uh, I come at it from a totally different way. I don't really understand all the nuts and bolts. Of course, I don't understand how we're talking to each other across the internet exactly, or how my mobile phone works that I talk into it, you know, within milliseconds, my wife can hear me. That doesn't make sense to me, but I don't really care. I've invested in all of those things and made good money. So I would say in those early days, when you, when you come across really smart people migrating to an industry, you need to stop and take notice. When you see technology criticized and maligned by the big powerful people, you need to stop and you need to spend time. And so I would have gone a little deeper and the other thing is, so 
people are so afraid of losing money that they miss opportunities to really make great returns. And for anything in your life that you come across, particularly related to technology, where there's an interesting opportunity, you should take a small amount and just put it in immediately, right? And if, if it goes to zero, that's great. In fact, you want some of them to go to zero because then you'll have some that go up 10x, 20x, 30x, 50x, 100x because you're taking the right risk reward. And that's why venture capital has created so much wealth. And my pinned tweet on Twitter, right, is the greatest wealth is created by investing in something that you believe in before others even understand. And that is really, really important. And particularly for a young person, most people don't do that, right? They're afraid to take that little money because they don't have much money and put it in something that could go away. But that's exactly what you want to do. So for everybody listening, right? Uh, again, we, we have 72 hours of like really good conversations, right? And, you know, whether you are one of the thousand students listening to this right now, right? Or you are just interested in blockchain or, and I know for a fact industry leaders watching this right now, uh, you know, hit rewind, like listen to what Mark's saying, right? Like it's important. Uh, uh, you'd listen to a really smart guy right now. And he's telling if you could go back, it would have just taken a double look at it. Right. And, and, and I find that with most things, you know, I think I, I spent a little time in Silicon Valley and I, I, I've always joked that like, you know, VCs and angel investors and, Right. I think they, they don't always like take the time to get to know projects. I, I've always felt there's an underlying just, you know, five minutes in a pitch and, you know, they want to see some pedigree on a deck and, you know, who's here, who's there. And, 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 and some of the technology isn't always easy to explain. And maybe th those are projects like Bitcoin didn't have like a chief marketing team or they didn't have a, a team that was focused to distill it down, right? Where it was, you really had to kind of search for that. Um, but, you know, I think you, you've kind of brought us up through your evolution, right? And kind of how you got involved with it and, and how, you know, Morgan Creek has spun off their digital uh, uh, section. You know, so you've kind of had a, a decent, I would say, front row seats. You would say you're one of the, you know, you were in it earlier, you know, not, not you're not Satoshi, but you're in it like pretty, cl <laughs> pretty close after. Um, where, so I, my next question is kind of like, where are we at today? And I'll caveat that with a few things. So I, you, you and I were joking before the call, I'd say, I, I've always laughed that, you know, I, I grew up in Las Vegas. I bought my first house when I was 19. I literally sold it like six months before the market completely crashed. You know, I'm, I'm 21 years old. I had just uh, started my first company, you know, and, and I'm watching Las Vegas guy, I'm watching the entire US economy collapse, right? And I'm watching housing collapse. And this is a lesson that's always stuck with me, right? And for a lot of people, I think, you know, a lot of people know, but I think there's a whole generation that doesn't really understand how bad things got during that time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, can, it, it just so happens to collide with the fact that Bitcoin came out, right? I always joke, I don't have it in front of me, but the, the first comment in the Genesis block is something about, you know, Chancellor to bail out banks or something. I laughed. I think we just saw another one a day or so ago, you know, around uh, another code commit kind of bringing it up to, to, to this time frame. But, you know, where are we at now? And, and I guess you can, as much as you want to extrapolate that to kind of global markets or perspectives, right. and how do you think that impacts benefits or hurts? Uh, you know, some people will say in, in this time, uh, the, this risky store of value won't be good. And other people now are starting to kind of double down on it. But, you know, where are we at today? And, and, and how, do you, how do you think that impacts the future? Look, I, it's such an important question. And, and, this is, again, why I'm now spending you know, 75, 80% of my time on this space is, is we are at what I believe is, is about to be the, the greatest wealth creation opportunity that, that I may ever see in my lifetime. I, I plan to be here a while, but uh, maybe there'll be one more really big one. But, but there's a coalescing, coalescing of, of a number of, of factors that are going to lead to this, this massive opportunity. So we're, this isn't the end right? It's not even the beginning of the end. It may be perhaps the end of the beginning, as Churchill said. So the key is that what we're seeing is this evolution of technology. So you asked, what, you know, what was my aha moment? My aha moment was when I finally realized this was not a get-rich-quick scheme. It was not a Ponzi scheme. It was not a bunch of tech anarchists trying to overthrow the world. You know, the funny thing is, right, this all started way back in 1988, right? The you know, um, the Anarchist Manifesto, right, was, was written by Timothy May, you know, God rest his soul, and no one read it. 
right? Because when you're an anarchist, you don't have any friends and you don't have any influence. So it spent 20 years doing nothing until, you know, he, she, they, whoever Satoshi-san happens to be, uh, came along and said, oh, I can use this anarchist manifesto thing to, to create uh, crypto anarchist manifesto to create this great thing called Bitcoin. And it was that seminal event. And I, and I love your point about, look, the millennials are maligned and everybody says, oh, they're lazy and this. The millennials are going to turn out to be the next greatest generation because look, they've had to endure so much and they've had to grow up so fast and they've had to be resilient far beyond any other generation uh, that had it so easy. So I really do think that there is a cycle of technology and it's a 14 year cycle and it's a 14 year cycle partly because young people create new things. It's not the old people, right? It's always young people. Like Mark Andreessen was 19 when he invented the web browser. And you go back and you look at, at every big innovation. Bill, Bill Gates, right? If you've seen the picture of the original seven Microsofties, Bill Gates looks like he was 12. Now, you know, he was only about 19 or 20, but he looks 12. I mean, he, so, he, he was, he, he was six, four on Zoom. Yeah, exactly. But uh, there's actually a funny story about that. So he looked so young that IBM was making their choice. And they had to choose between DOS, disk operating system created by Microsoft, and CPM created by this husband and wife team down in California. CPM, far better, right? Doesn't crash. You wouldn't have to reboot your computer you know, all the time. Way better. So IBM guys go to Washington. They meet with Gates. They thought he was the coffee boy. Said, nope, we're not doing it. They left, went to California. And the guy uh, at CPM would not meet with the IBM people until they signed an NDA. And the IBM people were like, no, we're IBM. We're not signing an NDA. He said, fine, then we're not meeting. So they left, went back to Seattle and bought DOS. And that's why Microsoft is Microsoft. So if you go back in time to 1954, right? Governments had computers, no businesses had computers. And there were these companies that said, we're going to create mainframe computers, right? DEC and Wang, and, and we're going to build these computers for, for businesses. And people are like, I don't need a computer. Well, yeah, they needed a computer. So then you go 14 years later, 68, the microchips invested or invented, and suddenly smaller computers. So now it's not just big business that can afford it. Now you've got small businesses and Spark workstations and IBM Vax computers and all this stuff uh, is now available broadly. So then 1982 comes, okay, 14 years later, and there's the personal computer. And Steve Ballmer goes to work for this firm called Microsoft. And his mom says, you know, honey, why would you work for that company? No one ever have a computer in their house. Yeah, he has 18 billion reasons he was right, mom was wrong. So you go 1996, the internet, you know, internet's never going to be more important than a fax machine. So says Paul Krugman, no, more important than a fax machine. So we made lots of money in the internet. Then 14 years later, the mobile net. And I actually remember being in Craig McCaw's house for a, an event up in Seattle. Uh, he's a big famous guy who did one of the first mobile companies. And I asked his, his uh, family office guy, you know, do you think the mobile net is going to be as big as, as the internet? He says, Mark, are you kidding me? He asked people if they want a personal computer. I'm like, yeah, I don't really need that. If you ask them if they want a cell phone, they say, well, I already got two. Probably don't need another one. So the mobile net, right, are these handheld personal supercomputers that we all carry around, um, that's incredible. And iOS and Android became the operating system for that. Well, fast forward to 2024 which is still four years from now, we're going to have the greatest innovation wave around the trust net, as I call it, or the internet of everything or the internet of value. And blockchain will be the operating system the same way that DOS was the operating system for PCs, the same way that the TCP IP was the operating system for the internet, the same way that iOS and Android are the operating system for mobile supercomputers. Blockchain will be the operating system for the internet of everything. And everything will run on a blockchain because triple entry accounting is superior technology. And it gets rid of these middlemen, which are the ones that fight hardest against this, this thing. So again, students are listening to this, thinking about this. We've all seen a parabolic curve, right? A curve that starts off pretty you know, low and then starts to bend and then goes parabolic on the other side. So if you think about that curve and you think about the area under the curve, back to math class, the left-hand side of that curve is internet 1.0. Very low slope, 
doesn't even look like that much area under the curve, but that created a lot of wealth. Microsoft, Cisco, you know, lots of great companies. Uh, but that wasn't even that big a deal. Web 2.0, area under the curve is bigger because now we're starting to curve up on the, on the curve. That area, much bigger, but that was Facebook, Alibaba, Amazon, e-commerce, all the things that have happened uh, in Web 2.0. But Web 3.0, which is the blockchain era, now we're going parabolic. The area under that curve is incomprehensible. And so the idea that the best is yet to come is really exciting. And that's why I'm spending so much time here. It's why we've raised two venture capital funds. It's why we invest in the protocols themselves. It's why I think that you know, when we think about Bitcoin as an asset or as a safe haven, you know, Bitcoin is digital gold. It has all the benefits and all the characteristics of gold, which gold has been hard money for 5,000 years. One ounce of gold buys a fine man's suit for 5,000 years. Cleopatra's time, turn of the century today, one ounce buys a fine man's suit, although no one wears suits anymore. Uh, but that gold is really hard to use. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, again, I'm a movie guy, ever seen the movie Knight's Tale? There's the, about jousting, Heath Ledger, you know, again, God oh, yeah, rest yeah, his soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, like, he's like the poor guy, they find him and then he becomes a prince or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's this scene where he wins the, the tournament and he gets this calf made of gold and he needs to pay off the debt for his squire and he literally bangs the thing on the table and breaks off the leg and says, okay, go do what you do. That's a really bad way to divide assets, banging it on the table. So what you know, Bitcoin can do as digital gold, as a digital store of value, is it can be down to you know, eight decimal points into Satoshis and you and I can exchange very small amounts or very large amounts. And it's just a better way of thinking about as we move from the analog world to the digital world, why a digital asset is gonna be so critically important. So, so many ways we could go with this, but the bottom line is it's early. There's so much yet to be done and there's so much opportunity. And so everyone listening to this and talking about this and, and attending the conference should definitely reimagine what they thought their future was going to be like, that engineering is just about this or finance is just about this. It's that merging of technology and finance that is going to be so important. And money over internet protocol is the biggest thing we're probably going to see in our lifetime. Got it. Beautifully said, by the way. Um, you know, I, I think if we... And the thing I'm curious about next is, you know, and, I, and I just pull while we're talking, I'm pulling up your guys' site, right? So, and I want to hear how you, your thoughts. You know, I, I think we could take, and I've always been intrigued by this. I, I think there's like, I always tell people sometimes, or I feel like people always struggle to kind of explain Bitcoin or things. And one of the things I've always tried to do in my life is be really good at like distilling technology from complication to the average user, right? Like, um, so I think. I sometimes tell people, hey, if, if blockchain was the app store, the number one app would be Bitcoin, right? So, uh, you know, we, we kind of know that the, the fintech, the financial applications of blockchain, these have kind of worked, right? Like we know block, Bitcoin works. Like I, you know, I, I ask partners or people sometimes to say, okay, would you send a billion dollars of Bitcoin and be uh, uh, very sure that it would get there? Yeah. Okay, cool. Like then now, okay, we know Bitcoin works. So we, uh, at least the perception or the social uh, kind of acceptance of it is there on that, on that form. And, and, you know, again, looking at your guys' site, you guys kind of list very clearly whatever your portfolio holdings looks like. And, and I don't know if it's updated. So it's, I see 82% Bitcoin, 9.8% Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, clearly you have a portfolio of, of assets, right? So, uh, you know, I'm, you probably trade them, right? This isn't necessarily, I'm not the biggest expert here, but that's one part of your strategy. Kind of pivoting to the other part on the, on the blockchain side, kind of getting out of the financial applications, you know, and, and, I'll for, and I'll kind of uh, uh, highlight a little bit like why I think this conversation is interesting. When we look at non-financial blockchain applications, like I've kind of come to the place where sometimes I'm like, man, I have a lot of developers, right? And even starting it is, you know, is, is there, there aren't, and maybe there still aren't a lot of really competent blockchain developers. And I would say, A, it's because it's just kind of complicated to build this technology. There's, there's no set standard yet we're kind of developing standards and the tools that we need but like still nobody knows what'll win right 
there was enough companies created that I think there's enough confusion around what's really good or not. Right. And there's some choices out there. Maybe people are falling for a multitude of reasons that may or may not be kind of dead ends, but you know, and I think even when we look at developers, right? Like I have a lot of friends in Silicon Valley, you know, heads of uh, AI for Facebook or Instagram or built Facebook ads, et cetera. Right. And for a long time, I've talked to these people and it's kind of like, it's the same thing. I think it's like when I look at people, my friends that have funds and stuff, I've never really seen them. Like it, to me, it would be like saying, I don't touch SaaS. I don't touch VR, right? To say, I don't touch blockchain. I just haven't heard that to take such a hard line, right? Like, it, and I kind of find the same thing with developers. It's just they, 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 this thing is so controversial. They take such a hard line. It's like, yeah, I don't want to become a blockchain developer, right? And then, yep. and I think especially for students listening, one day I kind of like wrote a chart. It's like, okay, like what is, rather than just using buzzwords, like why aren't there a lot of blockchain developers? What are the, the, the moving parts there? And I think when you kind of make a list, it's, it's, you know, kid coming out of school, what's your dream job as a developer, right? It might be Amazon, Google, Apple, Facebook, whatever. But it's like, okay, what's, what makes you good at your job there? Uh, making things a little faster, shaving off milliseconds, uh, maybe uh, uh, kind of rampaging customer data to find trends that produces, you know, a profit for the company. You kind of go down this list and then you compare it to anything blockchain and it's, it's a little bit the opposite, right? It's, they're, they're kind of inherently designed to go slower. Yep. Uh, they aren't going to be as good. Uh, they, they tend to be designed in a way that can't, you know, really invade people's privacy. So you kind of get to a point where it's like privacy matters, right? Mm -hmm. If you were to pick a point. And, and I think, and, and not to go on too long, but I, I really have thought, you know, we do a lot. Of, I do a lot in corporate innovation. So I deal with a lot of corporate partners, enterprise partners, and I've, I've consistently taken this stance where I think you can kind of remove privacy when you go to use cases for enterprise, right? Where it's like, I think the, the blockchain community is waiting for these, all these stats. It's like billions of users are using this, right? Which means that either banks are going to have to pick it up, right? Or all the people, a lot of them tend to hate. So like, how are you guys looking at adoption of blockchain? Like what companies interest you and yep. Are you guys, what do you guys see in regards to those friction points of, uh, to, that kind of get to adoption? No, no, really, really important points uh, in, your, in your question. If you think about, about blockchain, I, I totally agree with you that, you know, we don't say, oh, that's an internet company, right? We say that's a social media company. We say it's a, a financial services company. We don't say it's an internet company. It, it happens to use the internet. And when we're using our, our mobile supercomputers, we don't say, oh, that's, a, that's an iOS company uh, or an Android company. Um, they're, they're applications. So the same thing is true with blockchain. Blockchain is the underlying uh, technology. But at the end of the day, we're, we're investing in companies that either build tools or software or provide services. And so what we set up, uh, we set up Morgan Creek Digital and we went out to raise a fund. It's a venture capital fund that focuses on infrastructure, blockchain technology related infrastructure. So we invest in exchanges, tools, uh, protocols themselves. Uh, we've got a company that, that works on, you know, like the chain analysis type uh, work. Um, you know, we are looking for second layer opportunities, things like, you know, things that work on a lightning network or, or other uh, payment systems. So there are all of these applications that are going to be developed, but first you got to lay the pipes. You got to get the infrastructure down. You have to have, you know, all the, as you said, all the tools uh, for developers to, to utilize to, to make this a big part of, of uh, the ecosystem. So we raised that, that venture capital fund. While we were raising the venture capital fund, we had people say, well, okay, that's great. And most of the money is going to go into blockchain infrastructure. Um, but we'd like to also invest in the, protocols themselves. So we did a joint venture with one of our portfolio companies called Bitwise uh, in San Francisco. We created the Morgan Creek Bitwise Digital Asset Index Fund. Basically, it's a capitalization weighted index fund. We want it to become the S&P 500 of crypto. Now, that's an audacious goal, but, but why do we want it to be like that? Well, what the S&P 500 does is it picks the 500 best companies that most well represent U.S. business they exclude anything that's closely held. It's like Tesla. Tesla could be in the S&P, but it's too closely held to subject to manipulation, so they don't let it in. Same thing's true here, is we look at the top 
company or the top cryptos and we say, okay, anything that's closely held like XRP or Lumens, we don't put in the index. So we have the top 10 of the 12, it's weighted by capitalization, Bitcoin at the top, Ethereum second. You know, the funny thing about, about cryptocurrencies is it's, it's kind of like, I use the Saudi analogy, there's the king, there's the crown prince and all the other princes that hate each other. So same thing's true in, in crypto. You got Bitcoin as the king, Ethereum's the crown prince and all the other princes hate each other. So we started down the path of venture capital, raised a first fund, uh, went out for 25 million, raised 40 million, put that to work, 23 companies, 18% uh, is in Bitcoin itself that we believe is an investment in the network, right? If you wanna own Amazon or Facebook, which are networks, you have to own the equity of the hierarchical company. If you wanna own the network, the Bitcoin network, which is the largest, most secure network on the planet, you can't buy the company, you gotta buy the network itself, you gotta buy the protocol, which is actually cool because in the internet era, all the wealth wasn't created by the guys who developed the internet, right? Tim Berners-Lee, who built the World Wide Web, wrote the first web page using TCP IP, he's not a rich guy. He's doing fine, he's a Harvard professor, but he's not a rich guy. He should be a billionaire, but he's not. Why? Because he didn't charge to use TCP IP. Zuck came and built a free service. By the way, free is never free. You're paying for it in other ways. So free service that everybody uses, then he mines the data, sells it off. He became a billionaire using TCP IP. So Tim Berners-Lee should have got a share of that, but he doesn't. The nice thing in, in the crypto world is the protocol owners, right? Us who own the protocol are getting wealthy. And that's really cool. So if we, uh, so we raised our first fund, invested, we're raising our second fund today. We've closed on about 70 million of a 250 target. And we invest in companies that are building the rails, the infrastructure for this trust net, as I call it, that's coming in 2024. So, you know, we've invested in exchanges, we've invested in software tools. Uh, our two biggest investments right now are in financial services. I'm a financial services guy. I like the applications of financial services. And I think blockchain, particularly Bitcoin, will do to financial services what uh, the internet did to media, right? All the me big media companies, conglomerates are all very low value today. And all the network startups, the internet startups that, that replace them, you know, won all the business. So I think the same thing is true. So our two biggest investments are a company called Figure Technologies. They basically are a lending company. They're sort of like SoFi uh, on uh, the digital platform. But the thing that they did that is genius is they created a blockchain called Provenance which allows for the digital settlement of assets. So in the old analog world, you know, you have a paper application for a mortgage, it takes 60 to 90 days. They can refi a mortgage in five days. They can get you a home equity line of credit in you know, approval in five minutes, funding in four days. So that's all because it's digital, but you can't settle fiat on a digital network. So you have to convert that fiat into a token hash and it has to settle on the Providence blockchain. So while a lending business, a digital lending business could be worth four or $5 billion, the DTCC, you know, which is the analog version of how we trade stocks and bonds. Like if I want to trade a stock with you, right? My broker sends it to your broker, but the physical stock certificate, the paper certificate, 400 year old technology sits in Dallas. And this company DTCC processes 1.8 quadrillion. I'm not even sure how big that number is. It's a lot of zeros. 1.8 quadrillion dollars of volume and the banks get a little piece of that. So the banks don't want that to go away, but Mike Cagney has built the digital version, which may actually displace that. That could be a hundred, 200, $300 billion company, huge opportunity. So second one we like is BlockFi, right? Blockchain finance, don't call it a bank. It's a bank, right? You deposit digital assets, they lend those digital assets out, they charge interest, and then they pay their depositors interest. So if I take my fiat, put it in the bank, I make 1%. If I convert that fiat to a stable coin or Bitcoin and I deposit it at BlockFi, I get paid six to 8%. That's better. So it's, again, if you think about entrepreneurship, again, students really should need to think about this. If you want to be an entrepreneur, there are two types. Like people used to say to me all the time, Mark, you're so entrepreneurial. I'm like, I am not. I work for universities my whole life. I took no risk. I'm not an entrepreneur. I said, yeah, but you built things. You built a, a management company. You spun out of the university. You set up a private company. You hire, 
I'm like, hmm, okay, I'm a builder, but I'm a little E entrepreneur. Big E entrepreneurs invent new things. They build new big things, you know, Bill Gates or whatever. Those are big E entrepreneurs. That's not me. Little E entrepreneurs take new ideas and apply them to old technologies or businesses and make them better. Yeah, I can do that. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, you don't have to be the biggie. You don't have to have the big idea. You can just take new technology like blockchain technology and apply it to some business. Take, take uh, bank lending, right? Banks make loans. They don't keep the loans anymore. They securitize them and sell them off into the market. Well, to buy a bank loan takes 30 days to settle. Nine different systems have to touch it from COBOL to Sun. I mean, crazy. Why is that? It could all be automated onto one system onto a blockchain and we could cut instant we could cut settlement from 90 days, I mean 30 days to instantaneous. That's gonna happen. Someone's gonna build that company. That's not a big E entrepreneur, that's a little e entrepreneurial solution. Love it. A lot of good points there. Uh, and and I, I, I can tell this call is going to be one that like is, it could probably last forever and, uh, and, and, and probably ain't going to end up having enough time. Um, okay, so real quick, like, can you tell me like, how do you, what do you, what are your, what's your take on the current market right now? And, and we can probably zoom out a little bit from yeah. blockchain, but like, you know, the world's in turmoil. I, I'm probably one of those guys that's like, I, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of seeing what's going on. I, I read a lot of news. I'm a political junkie. I'm a, you know, uh, but you, I know for a fact without even questioning that you probably have more insight and like more friends and in, in, in your cell phone to like get the real answers. Like what is going on? How do you tie it to what's happening with blockchain or, or digital currencies? And how do you, how do you really think that, that, that it will impact the future of this industry? Look, it all goes back to what you said earlier that there's a reason that Satoshi-san created Bitcoin in the depths of the crisis uh, post you know, global financial crisis. Um, and that's because the fiat fiasco, as I like to refer to it, was created, started in 1971 when we went off the gold standard and allowed fiat to be created from thin air. That's what the word fiat means. And governments have a propensity to spend, right? If you think about the history of governments, every single one eventually fails. Why? Because they overspend. Every empire, right? The Roman Empire fell because they overspent. The British Empire failed because they overspent. The American Empire failing because we overspend. And so all governments have this propensity to do dumb things because you get a smaller and smaller cohort of cronies that become in charge. And the worst example is when you get to a single person, a dictator, and I call it the dictator playbook. And if you go around the world and look at the disasters, whether it be Zimbabwe or Venezuela or Argentina, it always comes down to this, this dictator playbook. And unfortunately, that's playing out all over the world. It's actually playing out in spades in the United States. So the problem we have with global markets is it's not the virus. Right? The virus itself is it's just a viral malady. And we've dealt with viral maladies for thousands of years. This virus is no different than any other virus. Um, the problem is the response. The response to the virus has plunged us globally into what will come out to be one of the worst recessions, if not depressions in history. What does that mean? It means that the people at the bottom of the pyramid are being impoverished at a, le at a rate that we haven't seen in decades because we were going the other way, right? That globalization was ri raising people out of poverty. Right? We had 700 million people in China come out of abject poverty in the last 30 years. Absolutely incredible. We've had all kinds of breakthroughs all around the world because of globalization. Look, Adam Smith was right 400 years ago that um, specialization, right, comparative advantage works. Right? If you are good at making sweaters and I'm good at making you know, bottled water, I should make bottled water and you should make sweaters and we should trade. That's how it should work. You shouldn't learn how to do bottled water and I shouldn't learn how to make sweaters. And so this idea of now going back to populism and nationalism and you know, everyone on their own is lunacy. 
But why would anyone want to do that? What's wrong with the system we've been moving toward? Well, the system we've been moving toward is more democratic. It's more uh, uh, equal. And what people at the top want is they don't want equality, right? They want cronyism. They want to be at the top. And so every dictator that comes along, they have a playbook and they concentrate the wealth in the hands of a small number of people, and then they devalue their currency. And that's exactly what's happening in every Western country in the world, where they are devaluing their currency. They're creating toilet paper out of their fiat currency. And because of that, it creates this massive opportunity for gold and other hard assets and for Bitcoin as digital gold. And it also creates opportunity for blockchain related industries that will reverse this challenge. Think about it. If, if suddenly we're going to take the supply chain that's gone global and bring it back and everyone's going to have to have their own supply chain, what does that mean for global profits? Well, they're going to go down because everybody's expenses are going to go up. Well, blockchain can strip some of those costs out because it's more efficient, it's more scalable, um, and we can have a single system. The other thing that blockchain does is it allows us for the first time to have truly borderless businesses and a world, right? If I want to send you a dollar, I have to have a bank account, you have to have a bank account, the bank charges us fees, they charge a fee if I want to send you that dollar. And you know, there are certain jurisdictions where that can't happen because of sanctions. Sanctions is just a, a sanitized word for financial terrorism. That's what it is, right? You want to be you know, really bad to a certain country, you put sanctions on them. And if we called sanctions starving children, we probably wouldn't do it. Right? We put sanctions on Iran and kids go hungry. That sounds less good than saying, oh, they're bad people and we need to sanction them. So uh, all of this comes back to this idea of, of the currency. The currency is what makes nation states powerful. And to weaponize that currency makes them more powerful. But we can opt out. We can take a portion of our wealth and we can opt out of that system. And I use the example of, again, it doesn't, won't work with this crowd, but I ask people to remember the lowest price that you paid for gasoline. And for me, it was 31 cents. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was Totem Lake 7-Eleven uh, in Seattle where I grew up and, or Kirkland, Washington where I grew up. And I went to California pre-crisis to visit my daughter and I paid $4.30 for a gallon of gas. It's the same gallon of gas. It does the same thing, produces the same BTUs, actually a little less because now it's got ethanol in it, uh, produces the same thing. So the gas isn't better. It's just that the dollar is less good. It buys less goods. And since 1913, with the creation of the Fed, the value of the dollar has gone down about 95%, the purchasing power of that asset. So from 1776 to 1913, a dollar is worth a dollar. Now there were a couple of fluctuations around the wars, but it was worth a dollar. Once the Fed was created and governments could issue currency by fiat and we just decoupled from gold, finally in, in 1971, making it official, we've devalued the currency. There's this funny joke, um, Jay Leno said, uh, uh, you know, there's talk about the government wanting to have a dollar coin. Well, they already have, it's called a nickel. So, you know, by devaluing the currency, they have achieved their goal, which is to increase the nominal price of the assets of the people at the top. So think about Argentina, Zimbabwe, uh, Venezuela. People forget the last two years, the top performing market, top performing stock market in the world was Venezuela. Would anyone want to own Venezuelan stocks? Hell no, because you got destroyed because the Bolivar went down. Now, if you owned Venezuelan stocks denominated in Bitcoin, ah, that's interesting. I like for everybody watching, you've watched me for like many hours the last few days. Like I like this guy and I, I, I want to go through probably a few points you said, cause like, I agree a lot, but you said about pomp earlier, like, man, I talked to this guy and I like him and I'm like, so like, here's the things I say on a daily basis. One, I've been working for a while. No one knows this like open source software. Cause like I've been looked at Venezuela, Zimbabwe, whatever. And I'm like, I, I, I feel like I know the first country of people that are really going to adopt blockchain and scale. It's going to be failing governments. Yep. So like for fun, I have a team of people working on like government in a box. So as these governments fail, we have an open source solution. You deploy it. Right. So I, I agree with this. Right. And then awesome. I think if you go, you know, a little farther down that, like, 
you know, looking at kind of where we're at in the market right now, you know, and I, and, and I think my experience with it ha had been, and I kind of mentioned earlier, and, and I'll use this in the context of 2008, because like for me and for any college student listening, like I don't have like a, the, the longest lifetime of experience, but I can tell you what I, like the only little bit I do know, you know, I'm 21. I had just taken my money from selling a house, start a company in technology to do smart homes. Well, the, there's signs of the market crashing. And I remember my grandmother telling me, you know, Patrick, how is this going to affect you, right? And I didn't know at the time, right? So I was like a little confident or cocky, you could call it. And I, like, I don't know, I'm not, you know, this, it's not going to touch me. Well, mm -hmm. then my, I have a quarter of a million dollars at 21, a product in some speculative home that some investors building, right? And then their deed goes out and I, I, I quickly learned that uh, banks have the first rights to, to, to the property before I do, right? And then yeah. I, I'm working with all these big guys who are construction, you know, construction companies. And, and they start, I, I just start, you know, I have literally, no idea what's going on right i'm 21 and I, I, I watched some one guy selling his boat next guy selling his, his second house right and just slowly until it, to the point where it got to me and you know it was like and i think people don't understand how connected this world is right yeah. so i my fear is is that the last few weeks if we go back eight weeks ago nine weeks ago when the, when the, like the dow started to drop etc right we, we hit nineteen thousand. i think it's a big big red flag everyone is freaking out cool now now i one of the things i think is people have very short-term memories right so then it quickly it goes back up to let's, whatever twenty four hundred dollar range so i feel like people are, are kind of the a little bit more calm now you know to a certain extent but you know I guess my gut feeling is that there's probably some inherent structural issues that are being exposed right now. And do you think that, that this is over, that it was like a slight bounce back and I'll, I'll kind of cap it off with this is psychologically, right? Like, and, and, and uh, another point is I always tell people, you know, especially people that, that weren't, uh, that aren't Americans, a lot of, a lot of people I deal with and say, in uh, 2007 or 2006, when you went to the bank, there was a placard on the, on the table that said your uh, investment or your deposit is shared at hundred thousand dollars. Well, that number changed right to 250. They update, they went and updated all those plaques, right? Because yeah. that was the fear at the time. So like, do you think we're close to that? And like, do you think this is going to get worse, better? And then what psychological doors does that open where now people for the first time, say i now i'm more now i'm op more open minded than i was to hear about something like bitcoin ah uh, that is that is a really really important point in fact one of the one of the best points that uh, i've had any interviewer ask in the, in the last uh, you know year or so that that is the point right so to your question are we at the, the end of of the bear market oh, the bear market has barely even started you know every bear market in equities has three phases it had, and this is Bob Farrell, famous Maryland strategist. He coined these terms is you have the sharp drop and that was March. Then you have the reflexive rebound and that's what we had in, in April. And then you have the fundamental downturn and that lasts 18 to 24 months. And that's what we've started now. And uh, if you think about the equity market, the equity market was overvalued by a mile uh, before COVID. And COVID was just the, the pin to prick the bubble. The bubble had been created by excess debt and buybacks and, and stock price manipulation and QE from the Fed. And, and all these things led to the, the bubble. And the bubble started to deflate. Um, but the reality was the Fed can't allow that to happen. And the current administration has been trying to get MMT uh, and there was no way to get MMT without a crisis. So this crisis gave them the perfect cover to say, oh, MMT, we can just print as much money as we need. You're deficit spending like we're at war. Oh, they even try to call it a war, right? They call it the invisible enemy and we're under attack. There is no enemy. We're not under attack. We are not at war. The reason they say the word war is to try to use war powers to overreach and get you know, abuses. And we've seen lots of those you know, the story this morning that Israel is talking about chipping kids to maintain social distancing. Holy crap, that is 1984 Orwellian. Or the guy in Hungary who got arrested for saying that the government was overreaching. Seriously, you're going to go into someone's house and arrest him because of what he said? That violates, you know, 
Now he's not American, but that violates our constitutional rights. So all kinds of crazy stuff going on. The real problem is everyone's convinced over the past 10 years to BTFD, buy the freaking dip. Well, why are they convinced about that? Well, because every time the market went down, the Fed or the ECB or the Bank of Japan or the Bank of China was there to pump liquidity into the system and it went back up. Now, that's fine in a normally functioning economy. A normally functioning economy, if you pump liquidity into the system, companies can become more efficient, sales can go up, people can buy more stuff, they can take more credit, house prices can go up, they can draw on a home equity, uh, they can go to Airbnb and get lots of, well, here's the problem. Now we're in total global lockdown. So the economic functioning is impaired. And now if you throw liquidity into a system that's facing a solvency crisis, you talked about with your home, right? Your home builders, right? If, if there's no buyers at the price, the price falls and they don't, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it, you're insolvent. Right? You can't fix a solvency, a bankruptcy problem. And the number of personal bankruptcies has gone through the roof. We have 33 million people that have been displaced out of work. Now, 90 plus percent of those are going to go back once we reopen, but 10% aren't. And 10% that lost their, lost their jobs, they can't make rent, they can't buy stuff, they can't consume Netflix. They're going to, all of these trends that have been so positive with all this liquidity suddenly turn negative. And George Soros has this, this theory, and, and it's called reflexivity. Now, his book is horrible. Like, he's just a horrible writer. The idea is awesome, right? The idea of he, reflexivity. He, 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 got, he got a D in writing. He should, have, he should have stuck with the other thing. Yes. I mean, he's an amazing investor. He's an amazing, you know, uh, leading thinker. And reflexivity is a great idea. He's just a horrible writer. So his book is really tough to read. Um, but reflexivity works like this, is... If you think about the bubble that created the opportunity for you in real estate leading up to it, right, is people would lend money to people to develop homes. And the more homes were developed, the more people came to Las Vegas and bought them and speculated on them. And they could get easy money and they could put no money down. That actually has an impact of increasing the price of homes. It's a reflexive, virtuous cycle. The more money that's created creates increasing prices, which creates more money, which creates increasing prices. And that virtuous cycle goes up. The problem is once it turns vicious and now prices go down, now there's no buyers. Prices go down more. Now there's fewer buyers. And the same thing's true in a market crash. And so the only thing that could stop the market from crashing in March was for the Fed and the government to come and say, oh, we're going to put in trillions, like six trillion. And again, just for the people on the phone or on the, on the, a trillion, when I say that word, you should shudder, right? You should, you should go, because a trillion is a dollar every second for 31,710 years. That's a big ass number. So six trillion is a lot of well, money. And, and, and actually, you know, if, if I go back, I think it's 2007, it is Obama versus McCain, McCain pauses his campaign, makes a big deal of it, goes to Washington, right, to kind of negotiate this deal. And I forget what the first kind of bailout was in 2008, right? But I think yeah. if we reflect back on the numbers now, like comparatively, they're minuscule, right? Oh, yeah, but 700 it's, billion. 700 billion doesn't even sound like real money. It, right? And, and so, like, do you feel like that this is just happening? I mean, I feel like the magnitude of the conversation, or how much people are reflecting on it, or it's really hitting their radar. Right. I mean, they, I think they're, they're maybe they're what's, what's really interesting about this is that the primary topic talking point that kind of sits above everything is COVID. Right. So then it's like everything under that is less. Right. But in 2008, yeah. we didn't have that. It was inverse. It was like, it was all economic. So and anything with money was the conversation where now it's the conversation is COVID and then the, the byproducts are, are, are economic. No, no. And that was the genius of, of your question earlier, which is, is this set of circumstances creating an environment where more people are suddenly going to pay attention to blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, and Bitcoin in specifics? Yes, absolutely. Because once the numbers sound unreal, and once you realize that the bulk of the money isn't going to where it's needed, so let's just do some math together. I have this hashtag math is hard um, that I, I use all the time. 
but let's just do it. Six trillion divided by, you know, 330 million people in the United States is roughly $58,000 a head. Well, stimulus checks were 1200 bucks, unless you made above a certain amount, then they were even less. Well, where's the other $57,000 going? Guess where? To cronies, to kleptocrats, to the people who contributed the most to the Trump campaign. I mean, it's going to the wrong places, right? It's like that public company, you know, with thousands of employees that somehow got a PPP loan for $96 million. Wait a minute, it was for companies under 500 people. Well, and we, and we found that out in 2008, right? It's like the money was dished out. And then six months later, the executives are, you know, the bank executives are, are being hauled in front of Congress to, to now talk yep. about their golden parachutes, right? So it, it takes, yeah. you know, there's a bit of an effect there. And I'll say it on two sides, actually. Like, I feel like, at least my experience, and in, 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 in obviously I have more than, you, you know, quite a bit more than me, but like, I feel like, it, and I, I mentioned earlier, uh, there was, I have a really, really smart friend, Justin Esch. Um, that's a shout out. This guy's been on Oprah. He invented bacon salt. Uh, yeah. So he called, he's called me only two times and knowing him for 10 years, like out of breath, Patrick, I got to talk to you. Once was, I just got off a call with like every investment group. Sometimes I think he's in Illuminati. I don't even ask what these calls are or who he's on the phone with, but I know him. Through, I trust him. Patrick, go look at developers. There's a lack of developers in this space. It needs your help. I literally turned my, like, I was like, all right, I was looking for the next thing to do. And we, I went head first. The second time he called me was maybe 10 days ago, right? Very late. And like, Hey, I got off a call. Right? And he's like, something's going on. He's like, I just got off a call. Right. And, and I didn't particularly ask him who was implied. And he, you know, what he told me is basically that it seems like maybe the certain companies are, you know, I think everybody, we're hitting a point where people maybe aren't paying their bills or not paying their rent. They can't pay their rent. They can't pay their mortgage payments. They can't pay their car payments. Maybe a bunch of cars are going to get repossessed. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe their people are waiting because they don't know where they're going to store the cars. Yep. Uh, uh, retailers saying that kind of capitulating and saying that they, that they knew the death of retail was coming, but that COVID has just accelerated by 10 years. Right. So then we see, uh, you know, what was the, uh, not on the J crew or yeah. I think that was it or right. And then Neiman Marcus did it. I feel like, you know, it, it, it's odd to have such high numbers, right? Like I feel like because this is a, a, a medical kind of the root cause that, that we're not looking at it as a, as a, as a clear global crisis. It's like that when this medical issue ends, yes, yes. That, that, that everything will come back to life. Right. And then it's, and I would say, it's like, you know, you could stick people in their house for four weeks. You could stick people in their house for eight weeks, maybe. Right. And say, okay, guys, everything is safe. Come out now and they'll come out. But when you come into 12 weeks, 16 weeks, 18 weeks, you start to hit a point where, you know, I've never been in prison, right? But I can only imagine, you know, Shawshank Redemption, right? Like yeah. uh, the, the old guy who left, he, he, he literally didn't want to leave jail, right? Like he was so comfortable there. Yeah. So, so maybe it's, it, maybe everything tomorrow, we get a memo and it says the uh, coronavirus ends uh, officially, mission accomplished, yep. right? And maybe people don't come out of their house, right? Maybe, maybe the market changes. And like you mentioned, 10% might seem like a small number, right? But like when you're saying uh, historically 10% unemployment is big right now, we're talking what, 25 plus? Yep. Do you think that it's a lot worse than people understand right now that in 90, 120 days, it's going to become it, it, more apparent? Oh, it's massively worse than people think. Look, earnings of companies are dependent on consumers buying their products or using their services, right? Airplane flights down 96%. Now that makes sense because, you know, people are locked in their house. They're literally imprisoned. You know, the funny thing I find about this, this period is how calm we've all actually been about being imprisoned. No, no shots were fired. No, no shots were no fired. Shots were they, fired. Put it, they, they put the entire world in their homes yeah. without a single shot fired. I know it's cra and think about it that the word quarantine was created during the plague for sick people, right? You put sick people by themselves for 40 days, hence the word quarantine. 
Okay. He didn't put well people away. He put sick people away. And I'll actually, again, because there's so many people on the phone or on the, the conference that are students, I actually believe shutting down colleges and sending those kids home might have been the worst decision we made. And this goes back to bad decisions come from bad data. So the problem with this whole thing is it all started with decisions made on the Imperial College study where they, you know, within days of the crisis, they're saying 2 million people are going to die. Absolute ridiculous on every level, right? It was just, it was a horrible model, horrible code, lots of mistakes, just a really bad, and there was zero chance if this actually was a novel coronavirus, which everyone claims that it is and not a bioweapon, there was no chance you're going to have 2 million people die. Just zero chance. But yet people freaked out about that. Then there was the next study said, oh, well, it's not going to be, a, it's not going to be 2 million, but it's definitely going to be 240,000 in the US. Nope, not even going to get there. Well, why not? Well, because again, viruses work a certain way. And what people were afraid of wasn't the actual virus, it was this data. And the data is even worse than we think it is because now we got the problem of uh, anyone who got a flu shot, which had coronavirus in it, regular coronavirus, may be testing positive if you test for COVID. Well, that's a problem. Like there was one, one jail, they said 96% of inmates tested positive for COVID. I'm like, yeah, because you inoculated 100% of them for flu. So maybe there's a correlation there. Let's check that. And so there's all of this decisions being made on data that isn't clean and isn't good. And when we actually have real good data, like, like the cruise ship, the Pacific Princess, right? That was a Petri dish. Everybody got it. We had a certain number of, of fatalities, case fatality rate. We can actually population adjust the numbers because we know how, how old everybody was. So we had a perfect experiment. When you take that data, Actually, if you're sub 45, this is the flu. Got the same case fatality rate as the flu. Um, really doesn't affect you. If you're 45 to 65, it's like double flu. It's like a bad flu. If you're over 65, it's a nasty little bug. It's not SARS or MERS, right? SARS killed 10% of people. MERS killed 33% and Ebola is 50%. None of those things. But it is interesting how we locked down an entire world and we all took it to your point. No shots were fired. And yet, you're absolutely right that at some point, behavior does change. And so, are people going to get on a plane and go to conferences? Hmm. They're going to find out that virtual conferences actually aren't that bad. So, that's going to reduce travel. Are people going to you know, jump on cruise ships tomorrow? Yeah, actually, people are going to go on cruises because people like cruises, um, even though they're just petri dishes, but people are going to go on cruises. Uh, are people going to buy as much stuff? What we found is, hmm. Huh, I don't really need as much stuff. You know, look at everybody's visa bill. It's down just because you, know, you can't go out and buy stuff. Um, how's your eating habits going to change? Oh, cooking is actually not that bad. Maybe I'm not going to go out to restaurants as, more, as much. And if you make restaurants do social distancing, which this, this makes me crazy, one, one little rant. So they did a study of a, a huge number of patients uh, who actually had the virus. And they did contact tracing to find out where they found, where they got the virus. and 74% got it from intra-home transmission. So people in the same household, right? So you have to be in the same house for an extended period of time to actually get the virus. Only 26% got it from community transmission indoors. 0.0% got it from outdoors. So shutting down beaches, shutting down outdoor sporting events, absolutely ridiculous because you can't catch the virus on the beach. You just can't. I mean, okay, if you're making out with someone on the beach, maybe you could catch it, but standing on the beach talking to your friends, not going to catch it. So, uh, and I kind of want to move on for a second, but like, do you think anything good is coming from this? And, and I was with a friend the other day joking and they, they said something like, you know, and, and you could kind of, I've heard people say like, uh, you know, I wish we would care about uh, like climate, you know, what, whether you believe in climate change or not. Like, I wish we would take the same action on climate change as we did with this. And, and actually, when I reflect, right, like, this is actually, 
we could take this same roadmap. Like we, we, could, we could actually just pretend if we really wanted to stop climate change one day, just take this same roadmap to put the same thing, right? Keep everyone in their home, keep them off the road, keep them consuming less, right? Like, do you think that people learned anything or is there anything good from this experience that you, that you feel, you know, whether it's a sense of community or yeah. people kind of caring about each other? I think it's a great question. I, I think clearly, <laughs> definitely, we all have a greater appreciation for teachers, right? Because people having to educate their kids at home have learned that, oh, this is hard. So I think we have greater appreciation for teachers, much greater appreciation for first responders and people on the front lines. Now, we always appreciated doctors and nurses, but I think this really uh, made us understand how important that, that first line of defense is. Uh, so I think there's, there's some sense of community. The one thing I don't like, say I don't like the term social distancing, I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We should be going social closeness. We should be getting closer rather than further apart. Even physical distancing doesn't make sense to me, right? We should call it community protection. We should protect our communities. We should protect the vulnerable, right? We should take the people like my parents in their 80s, make sure they don't get the virus. We should protect them. But the people who are under 45, who it's, you're unlikely to even get the virus, even if you get the virus, you're unlikely to be impacted by it. They should be, you know, out being socially bonding to your sense, forming community. And this idea that, that we want to distance people, it's funny how things happen. So last night, you know, we have a, a unique family. So I have two older kids uh, and then we got the bonus 20 years later. So we have a nine-year-old and you know, my wife and I are in our, you know, I just turned 57, my wife's 56. So we have the nine-year-old kid. And last night we watched WALL-E. And I didn't remember this from the first time I watched it 20 years ago that in the, the story, right, Wally is this little robot that's cleaning up the earth, right? Which had basically blown up and, and they sent the ship out and, you know, for 700 years before it could come back, before life actually grew again on the planet. And to your point about climate change and maybe we should address some of those things. But the real amazing thing was on the ship, the people had devolved into these big blobs that were carried around on these floating chairs with the screen. And they watched the screen all day and did nothing else. And if you think about it, by imp imprisoning us in our homes, we're supposed to just consume Netflix all day and do nothing productive. And then they're gonna send us money to do that. I was like, holy shit, this is the future? I don't want this it's, future. It's getting dark, like, like really, you know, I, I, I look at it from a few points. Like you said, gold earlier, I, I'm not an economist. I've always been very good at math, so I understand principles. Like I, I always laugh if there ever was a, such a, a, a thing that people adhere to like the gold standard where maybe I looked at it and say, uh, if, if that's been replaced, like if there is a hard asset that probably holds true, maybe it's real estate-ish. When I look up into space, it's always intrigued me, right? Like when I see companies like Planetary Resources, where it's like the minute I knew that like a company's goal was to like put out little satellites, find rocks with like high levels of platinum or gold or whatever, go tow them back to earth, uh, put them in orbit around the moon, mine them, bring the resources back. You could theoretically start to make economic models to say, you know, if you brought back trillions and trillions of dollars of platinum or gold or whatever, how then you say, okay, maybe, maybe you could start building apartments in space, right? How, how much cash or how much money would you need printed to buy a billion condos in space, right? It's, it's essentially endless. Like you, you now hit the point where you would have to turn the money printers on, right? I, I, again, I'm not an economist, but I can, yeah. I, at least in my simple napkin math, I, I can't find uh, high level arguments. And then, and then you look at things like AI and, 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 you know, automated jobs, the gig economy, et cetera, where I, I think, again, people don't really understand I me. Mean, you just take the trucking industry, trucking industry being automated in America. People don't get it. They think of it as just truck drivers aren't there anymore, but it's, as you drive across America, for everyone listening, the reason you see so many McDonald's and motels and gas stations is not for you, the guy going to the park. It's for the people driving the trucks around Fair Products and Walmart. So you just don't take out the truckers. There's this kind of, um, you know, uh, umbrella effect. But, you know, so I think we've kind of seen things and I'm playing off what you just said about the government paying people. 
we've kind of seen examples of, of uh, you know, universal basic income. You've seen it in European countries testing it. You know, you've seen Y Combinator do things like uh, in Sam Altman in, in the East Bay and I think in Oakland, right? They really start. So uh, people look at it, maybe uh, there's clearly, and, I, and I, I'm probably speaking from an American perspective, like, you know, you, you could say one half of, the, of the, the political side says, oh, we don't want to give money to people, right? Like then yeah. they're, they're the po- people paying their politicians are okay with tax breaks, right? But, you know, I think in this sense, essentially right now, everyone's living off a stimulus check, right? And, and yeah. not, not everyone, but like, I, I mean, a lot of people. And it's to the point where they can't pay their rent, they can't pay whatever. And now they kind of need another one, right? Like they're not back at work yet for the most part, right? And they need another one and another one and another one. So it's like, we might get stuck in that model, right? And, you know, so I, I don't want to go on too long. And, and no, no, these no, are one no. of those. You, you brought up a, a bunch of really, really important points and, and, you know, we're running out of time, but, but the, the key to this is it's a bad system. And I, I say it all the time. If, if creating wealth was as simple as printing money, every country would do it. Every country would just print money. It doesn't work. And in fact, there's lots of examples, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Weimar, Germany, where it doesn't work. And hyperinflation comes, too much money chasing too few goods. The only way creating money can create wealth is if it stimulates economic activity, right? If you and I get off the couch and we go build something. The problem is we're doing the exact opposite. We're incentivizing people not to work. And that's where the system breaks down. And that's where you devolve into this, this disaster. Because money won't create condos in space. Money won't mine platinum off asteroids. You actually have to have physical people build the rockets and build the condos. And that requires human ingenuity, human engineering, human activity. Everything we do in the world, and this, this is perfect because it wraps it right back to Bitcoin. Everything we do in the world is about converting energy into value, right? We turn on the lights, we get in the shower, we're consuming, we're consuming hydrocarbons from that electricity or that hot water to then reinvigorate ourselves in the morning to go out and do good in the world. And so it's our human energy. We put fuel in our body to create energy, to create value. Bitcoin takes energy, stores it, in value and becomes the perfect store of value. And Jimmy Song talks about this. If you haven't had Jimmy Song on, you should have him on. But he talks about this in the sense that fiat currency is all about spending and about waste, okay? Bitcoin is all about saving and entrepreneurship. If you know that your money is sound and you know that you can get sound money by providing a good or a service, you will do it. If you think you can get more toilet paper money printed and handed to you for doing nothing, you'll do that. A country or an economy or a globe that does nothing will devolve into nothing. A country that revolves around entrepreneurship and wealth creation and innovation, back to my whole reason why I'm in this business, why I love it, is I love investing in innovation. I love backing entrepreneurs. I love talking to people like you who are young and motivated and hungry and will take the the brain, that God-given talent, and then utilize it to build new things. And Andreessen's whole call to build and and everybody's giving him shit about it. It's like, no, everything is about building. If we don't build, we die. And I'm a biology guy, right? I studied biology. I think it's the best training in the world for investing and for life. And it's because of the scientific method and hypothesis testing and gathering data and interpreting the data dispassionately without bias. And then, you know, nice thing about science and hypothesis and and, uh, experiment, either right or wrong. It's not about, I think I'm right. I did the experiment, it either worked or it failed. But in biology in particular, there are only two states, growth and death. I like the first. I don't like the second. And to, and to your point, the 
that was say that the the cousin of death is boredom, or boredom is the cousin of death, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, the 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 the, the mind numb brain, right? And, and actually, if you and and, and and for everybody listening, like uh, we were supposed to be on for forty five minutes. Uh, Mark's been nice enough to give me quite a bit longer than that. Uh, what I was gonna say is that even go back to like one of the first times in human history that we see a first world country like America where, where death rates, mortality rates are going down in, in you know, Caucasian males. This is, a, this is a byproduct of the 2008 recession where people have this expectation, as you said earlier, people kind of give millennials shit, right? Where like there may be a little more battle hardened that people understand where 35, 40 year old people in 2008, when they realized like what they thought their life was going to be was not, they started drinking and taking opiates, right? So there is a, like, we think that just watching Netflix and not having a job, it's fun for about a month, right? It's fun for about two months, you know? And then like, it's not as fun anymore. So no, uh, I, I have, I'll kind of lead us to one last question and we'll wrap it up. And, and again, it's been a pleasure, honestly, this, again, this is, one of those conversations I could, I could probably do for a lot longer. Um, but, you know, for, for the, yeah, I appreciate that. So for the thousands of students listening to this and for everybody else, A, listen to, if you listen to this once, listen to it again. That's my advice. But like Mark, if you, for the 19 to 21, 22 year old student listening to this right now, if you could go back in time, you're a college kid today, what would you tell them? Like, and, and I'll preface it just a little bit. Like, they're like, you know, I'm gonna get in the blockchain, like their mom's calling them like, oh, this is, a, you're gonna get in the, the drug coin, right? Or, yeah. you know, and, and it always surprised me that how many legal students we see in the, for the university program we have coming to the table, business development people. Yep. What advice would you give them today? How would you tell them to think about this? Yeah, no, I, I love this, because I, I do tweet about this, I, you, know, you know, advice to my younger self, and I've done it multiple times, uh, and, 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 I, and I believe this, right? One is, is, uh, I would, I would take more philosophy and psychology um, just because that's, that's most of life is about dealing with, with individuals and, and understanding how people think. So those are, those are two things. Uh, second is, is to write a lot. Um, there's a great quote that if I can't read what I wrote, how do I know what I think? So forcing yourself to write and, and to, to put down your thoughts on paper and communicate them to other people, uh, practice public speaking, uh, you know, get out there and, and you said it earlier, and I think it is a superpower. If you can take complex ideas and make them simple, absolute superpower, absolute superpower. Um, the other thing is, is to take more risks, right? To, when you're young, you should take lots of risks, right? You shouldn't take the safe job. You should take the unsafe job. And I don't mean physically unsafe, but I mean, you should go to the startup. You should start your own thing. Don't go to the big corporation. Don't worry about you know, your resume. Worry about your experiences, your life experiences. When you're young, right, if you fail, go back and do something else. Start over. You know, I, used to fr I used to fret about all this stuff. My first boss had this great line. He said, Mark, what are you worried about? You could build sailboats in your backyard for the first five years. No one will care. You'll still be a guy with Notre Dame degree, a Chicago MBA. People will hire you because you're a good, smart guy. Stop stressing about it. Go try things. So that, that's another one. Um, network, 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 and then network some more. I blew this. I, have, I do not have the, the great network that I should because I, I, I'm more of an, as my wife would say, I'm not as EQ as I should be. I don't, I don't relate to people as much as I should. And, you know, I forget to, to call my friends and, and to, to make sure I check in on them. But, you know, develop really deep, meaningful friendships and, and seek out mentors and find people to to hang out with that know more than you do and that you can learn from uh and people say all the time well how do i get a, a great mentor ask people love to be asked just ask and, and literally ask people way up the food chain you don't have to ask well do both right and then the last thing is to read read about successful people read about people you admire because you can learn from people in reading about them how they think how they live uh, there's a good friend of mine who's a great money manager, and he's read a hundred biographies of famous investors. A hundred. It's awesome. Um, other thing would be to um, buy some Bitcoin, right? Buy 1%, right? And if you're younger, buy more, but buy some. Just don't wait. Don't worry about a pullback. Don't worry about the price. The price, the daily price of Bitcoin doesn't matter. What matters is ownership of the network. You have to own a piece of the network in order to win. 
So, so buy some. Uh, don't invest in cash and fixed income. Um, invest in things that grow. Uh, invest in equities, invest in technology. Uh, be overweight private investments, be overweight things like real estate that can appreciate over time. And because uh, your, your, your fixed income portfolio as a young person is your future income, right? That's basically a bond and your future social security if that still exists in the future. Those are bonds. So don't worry about having that low risk stuff. Take the risk because as a young person, you get to benefit from the greatest benefit or advantage of an investor, which is time arbitrage. Time arbitrage is the greatest superpower in investing. If you can have a longer time horizon than other people, you will win. So the people who you know, focus on the daily price miss the opportunities for long-term investing. And then um, I guess the last thing would be uh, just golden rule, right? Do unto others, be a good person. Uh, my big thing right now is be the hotline. There are a lot of people suffering right now, to your point. A lot of people drinking, taking opioids, trying to ease the pain. There are a lot of people, unfortunately, they're going to take their lives. Uh, we all know somebody who's vulnerable. Pick up the damn phone and call them, right? Don't, don't tweet out a hotline number, right? Be the hotline. Call people, um, build that community, protect that community, and, and engage in stuff like this, right? I mean, anyone who's listening to this, I applaud because you're taking time out of what is an otherwise busy life and you're investing in yourself, you're investing in education, you're investing in networking, you're investing in, in your understanding of the world around you and you're seeking out you know, smart people like the other people you've talked about uh, that uh, are legendary in this space. Uh, I appreciate being included. I appreciate you, you asking. I really have enjoyed this conversation and uh, probably could go a couple more hours, but I got to do a client call here in a couple minutes. So. Uh, thanks for having me. Mark Yusko, for anyone listening, we're at, you're at the end. Go grab a drink of water, hit rewind, listen to it again, right? Like these are the conversations that matter. This guy is smart. And he, he honestly, you see, I don't know you, Mark, we just met, but like it, what's clear to me it, it, is that you care, right? Not only do you have a good perspective, but, you know, kind of the last aspects you hit on, kind of had nothing to do about business, right? It's, it's be a good person. Like this is what I have undertook from business. You want to be a good networker, build a great reputation. <laughs> this is going to go very far. You're never going to have to place an ad or do anything else. People will come to you, right? Uh, Mark, if I, uh, I want to put up 500 bucks for some books. If I do that, will you get us a, a list of maybe five books? I'll going to do a giveaway to the students. And uh, I'll, I'll buy some books and you give the list. Absolutely. Love to do it. Uh, I, I, look, I'm a big believer in reading, as I said, and uh, love, love to do that. So let's, let's do it. So I'll, I'll circle up on you separately. But Mark, again, I, I know you got to run. Really appreciate your time. Um, and again, for everybody listening, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Mark, it was very nice talking with you guys. We have, I don't know what point we're at in this conference of this, but we're doing this for 72 hours. We are having a lot of great conversations. I'm lucky. I don't even know how I'm on this call right now. If I could, you guys will see by the end how many people I've got to talk to. And I pretty much have had a smile on my face for the last week. So any last words before we go, Mark? No, look, I, I think your, 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 your uh, brilliant statement at the end there, which is, I say I have the time. I have the greatest job in the world. I get paid to talk to the smartest people in the world about investing. And if I can't pick something up, uh, that's my problem. So you know, what you're doing is fantastic. It's a great service to anybody who is, is participating and I really applaud it. I, I have, I've really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I look forward to spending more time together in person when we're out of lockdown. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll do all those great stories that I always say that require a, a beer and a, and a, a late night uh, together. So we'll, uh, we'll do that. Be well, be safe. Everybody on the call, thanks for, for uh, listening. And uh, I hope uh, if anyone needs anything, uh, reach out anytime. I'm easy to find on Twitter uh, through DM and uh, at Mark Yusko, and we'll talk to you soon. Mark Yusko, Reimagine 2020. Let's keep this thing going. Everybody have a great day. Stay tuned to learn more about the state of blockchain education at major universities all around the world. Reimagine 2020.